on World News Tonight. Last off, India shoots for the moon with the latest Trumpian spacecraft with added hopes of a soft landing. Concerned pay rises. Rishi Sunak accused of treating migrants as cash cows to fund public sector pay rises. Bans lifted. EU releases import restrictions on food products from Fukushima in accordance to IAEA assurances. And fantastic frescoes. Swiss artists etch works of art into the great mountain slopes and the villas and salon. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and you are watching World News Tonight and we start off with exciting updates in India as the nation is bidding to become only the fourth country to execute a controlled landing on the moon with the launch of its Chandrayaan-3 mission. Chandrayaan, which means moon vehicle in Sanskrit, took off from the Satish Dhawan Space Center in southern Andhra Pradesh state at 2.30 p.m. In India's second attempt at a soft landing after its previous effort with the Chandrayaan-2 in 2019 failed. Its first lunar probe, the Chandrayaan-1, orbited the moon and was the deliberately crash-landed into the lunar surface in 2008. Developed by the India Space Station Research Organization, Chandrayaan-3 is comprised of a lander propulsion module and rover. Its aim is to safely land on the lunar surface, collect data and conduct a series of scientific experiments to learn more about the moon's composition. Only three other countries have achieved the complicated feat of soft landing a spacecraft on the moon's surface, the United States, Russia and China. Indian engineers have been working on the launch for years. They are aiming to land Chandrayaan-3 near the challenging terrain of the moon's unexplored South Pole. Meanwhile, in the region, foreign ministers and top diplomats greeted Indonesian President Joko Widodo ahead of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Regional Forum in Jakarta on the final day of the bloc's annual ministerial meeting. U.S.-China rivalry, the war in Ukraine and North Korea missiles are set to dominate roundtable talks in Southeast Asia's annual security gathering. Amongst those attending the ASEAN Regional Forum were United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and Chinese top diplomat Wang Yi, replacing Foreign Minister Xin Gang, who is absent due to health reasons. The 27-member ARF convened to provide an arena for big powers to lock heads over a range of issues, and the closed-door roundtable has previously been in a fractious affair. In opening remarks, ASEAN Chair Widodo said that the gathering aimed to seek solutions rather than exacerbate regional and global problems. Furthermore, host Indonesia warned that Southeast Asian bloc ASEAN cannot become a proxy as US-China tensions flare over self-rule Taiwan, Beijing's close ties with Moscow and tug of war for influence in South Pacific. There is unrest over in the United Kingdom as the nation has offered millions of public sector workers pay raises in a bid to end strikes triggered by a cost of living crisis as thousands of junior doctors walked off the job in protest for five days. Britain's government decided to accept recommendations for pay increases giving doctors and teachers at least 6% increases. It's been like this for months. Public sector strikes on a scale not seen for decades. Hurting our hospitals, schools, railways, airports. Today, the Prime Minister finally trying to call them off with an up to 7% pay offer for millions of workers. I can confirm today that we are accepting the headline recommendations of the pay review bodies in full. But we will not fund them by borrowing more or increasing your taxes. It would not be right to increase taxes on everyone to pay some people more. An estimated £5 billion pay rise for millions, paid for through existing departmental budgets and an increase in the levy migrants pay for NHS access. Today's offer is final. There will be no more talks on pay and no amount of strikes will change our decision. The PM walking away with a quick win as teaching unions told members to accept the offer and call off autumn strikes. Our members have won this 6.5 and won this 900 million and won these movements on workload that the Prime Minister has signed up for. That's why I think members should now bank the success 
that they've, they've made. You didn't say that this is value to you, but actually you brought in an anecdote, haven't you? The government promising that extra money for pay won't come out of schools' budgets, which unions say are already underwater. Still, after making uh, cuts and looking at everything um, very, very closely, uh, we are kind of just in line, uh, maybe slightly below, depending on actually how the funds are allocated. Uh, so to be honest, until I actually see the, the revenue come in, I'm very, very sceptical. Junior doctors who've just begun a five-day strike rejecting the offer outright. This is a, another offer that has been imposed on us without our consent, without our negotiated agreement, and it just goes to show how out of touch the government is. When Rishi Sunak says they're not going to talk, and no matter how much we strike, I think we're going to see in the future, really, if that statement holds up to truth. Mr Sunak will hope ending school strikes will endear him to some voters, but he's far from drawing a line under the strikes damaging the country and him. The International Criminal Court's top prosecutor told the UN that an investigation has been launched into reports of killings, rapes, arson, displacement and crimes affecting children in Sudan's Darfur region. The International Criminal Court has launched an investigation into a surge in hostilities in Sudan's Darfur region, the court's top prosecutor told the United Nations on Thursday. That includes reports of killings, rapes, arson, displacement and crimes affecting children. Ethnically motivated violence has escalated in Darfur since mid-April. That's after a power struggle exploded between Sudan's regular army and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF. Concerning the killing of 87 ethnic Masalit. In a report to the UN Security Council, the ICC's prosecutor Karim Khan confirmed investigations covering crimes in various parts of Darfur. That includes the West Darfur city, El Ganena. There, witnesses have reported waves of attacks by Arab militias and the RSF against the non-Arab Masalit people. On Thursday, the UN's Human Rights Office said at least 87 people, including ethnic Masalites, were buried in what it described as a mass grave in West Darfur. It added that there was credible information that the Rapid Support Forces were responsible. RSF officials denied any involvement, saying the group was not a party to the conflict in West Darfur. The RSF was formed out of the Janjaweed militia that helped the government crush a rebellion by mostly non-Arab groups starting in 2003. Under a 2005 UN Security Council resolution, the ICC's jurisdiction is limited to the Darfur region. In a surprising move, the European Union has agreed to remove import restrictions on food products coming in from Fukushima. They say that the decision was based on scientific evidence and assessment from the IAEA. The European Union on Thursday announced it would lift restrictions on food imports from Fukushima and any Japanese import restrictions imposed after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident. On our side, the European Union side, we agreed to lift the remaining restrictive import measures that were linked to the Fukushima accident. We have taken this decision based on science and based on the proof of evidence and based on the assessment of the International Atomic Energy Agency. While the European Commission says that the restriction had been fully lifted, it called on Japan to continue to monitor for radioactivity and publish its findings. Since an earthquake and tsunami wrecked the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in 2011, the EU had required pre-export testing of food products for radioactivity. And since 2021, it had required certificates showing levels of radioactive isotopes in a number of agricultural and fisheries goods from the area. With the latest lifting of restrictions, the EU hopes that Japan will also ease restrictions on EU farm produce, as European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said both sides had also agreed to work on removing Japanese trade barriers to EU beef, fruit and vegetables. In response, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida welcomed the latest EU announcement, saying the lifting of the restriction will help drive forward the reconstruction of the devastated areas, adding that Japan would also make a judgment on EU farm produce restrictions based on science, as the EU had done in lifting its restrictions.
We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now get more updates on the food front as two WHO agencies, the International Agency of Research on Cancer and the Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives, conducted independent but complementary reviews that suggest the popular sweetener aspartame as possibly carcinogenic. One of the world's most popular sweeteners is a, quote, possible carcinogen, but it remains safe to consume at already agreed levels. That's according to two groups linked to the World Health Organization, who made the rulings on Friday. Video released by the WHO showed experts from the panels discussing the findings in a news conference on Wednesday. So the working group classified aspartame as possibly carcinogenic to humans, that is group 2B, based on limited evidence for cancer in humans. Aspartame is one of the world's most popular sweeteners. It's used in products from Coca-Cola diet sodas to Mars extra chewing gum. The ruling puts aspartame in the same category as aloe vera extract and traditional Asian pickled vegetables. While the findings may cause some alarm, WHO Head of Nutrition Francesco Branca played down the likelihood of aspartame sweetened products actually causing cancer. The conclusion of this assessment are not indicating that consuming products containing sweeteners uh, automatically lead to a health impact. Um, having an acceptable daily intake, it means it is acceptable to consume a certain amount of aspartame without having appreciable health effects. This amount is uh, pretty large. Several scientists not associated with the review said the evidence linking aspartame to cancer is weak. Food and Beverage Industry Associations said the decisions showed aspartame was safe and a good option for people wanting to reduce sugar in their diets. But others have said the findings should lead to changes, including the US Center for Science in the Public Interest, the CSPI, and one of its top scientists, Dr. Thomas Galligan. This is something that industry consumers and regulators really need to take notice of. This is very concerning. CSPI would like to see industry begin to reformulate their products to use safer alternatives and help consumers avoid and minimize their exposure to aspartame. Similarly, policymakers can also take this very important and authoritative evaluation under consideration and start taking steps to protect consumers as well. Ahead of the announcement, some doctors expressed concern that diet soda consumers could now switch to caloric, sugary drinks Therese Bevers from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston told, quote, The possibility of weight gain and obesity is a much bigger problem and bigger risk factor than aspartame could ever be. But the WHO and others have stressed that consumers faced with the decision between a sugar drink and one with sweetness should actually consider a third option. Drink water instead. Meanwhile, South Korea has slapped fresh sanctions on North Korea in response to its recent ICBM launch. The provocation also prompted a UN Security Council meeting, but that once again ended with no tangible outcome. The South Korean government has made clear that North Korea's provocations will inevitably come at a price. In response to Pyongyang's launch of a Hwasong-18 ICBM this week, the Foreign Ministry on Friday slapped sanctions on four individuals and three institutions involved in the regime's nuclear and missile development. This is the tenth round of sanctions put in place against the North since the beginning of the Yoon administration. The four individuals on the blacklist are former and current high-level North Korean officials, including the director of the General Political Bureau of the North Korean Army. They were involved in the development and financing of nuclear and missile programs and engaged in commercial activities that violate UN Security Council sanctions. North Korea's latest missile launch has also prompted the UN Security Council to convene an emergency meeting. However, members of the UNSC failed to hold North Korea accountable for its recent missile launch due to China and Russia's opposition. Speaking at the meeting for the first time in over five years, North Korea's envoy to the UN defended the latest ICBM test, saying it had no negative effect on the security of its neighbors. Our test fire of a new type of ICBM, Hwasong-18, is a warranted exercise of the right to self-defense, to, self to deter dangerous military moves of hostile forces, and safeguard security of our state and peace in the region. Pyongyang's envoy also slammed South Korea and the U.S., arguing that strengthening deterrence between the two countries is a threatening act and heightens the risk of nuclear war. 
Meanwhile, the U.S. also demonstrated its ironclad commitment to reinforcing extended deterrence in South Korea by conducting combined air drills with Seoul over the Korean Peninsula on Thursday. Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff explained that South Korea and the U.S. enhanced their ability to conduct combined operations by swiftly deploying Washington's extended deterrence asset. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission has opened an investigation into OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, on claims that it has run afoul of consumer protection laws by putting personal reputations and data at risk. OpenAI, which kicked off the artificial intelligence craze with its hugely popular chat GPT, is under investigation by the U.S. government. The Federal Trade Commission has opened a probe into the San Francisco-based startup on claims it has run afoul of consumer protection laws by putting personal reputations and data at risk. That's according to a document the FTC sent this week to OpenAI, demanding records about how the company addresses risks related to its AI models. The move marks the strongest regulatory threat yet to the company, which is backed by Microsoft. ChatGPT became the fastest-growing consumer software platform after it launched roughly eight months ago, enthralling consumers and businesses while raising concerns about the potential risks of generative artificial intelligence. The FTC is investigating whether OpenAI engaged in unfair or deceptive practices that resulted in reputational harm to consumers. One of the questions has to do with steps the company has taken to address the potential for its products to, quote, generate statements about real individuals that are false, misleading, or disparaging. As companies race to develop more AI services, potentially upending the way societies and businesses operate, officials are scrambling with how to regulate the powerful technology. The dangers of AI could be extreme. In the U.S., Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has called for comprehensive legislation to advance and ensure safeguards on AI and will hold a series of forums later this year. There's a lot we still don't know about AI. We need outside help if we want to ensure congressional action is effective, responsible, and promotes innovation in a safe way. The Washington Post was first to report the FTC probe into OpenAI. The agency declined to comment, and OpenAI did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Leaders of a Hollywood's Actors Union voted to join screenwriters in the first joint strike in more than six decades, shutting down production across the entertainment industry after talks for a new contract with the studios and streaming services broke down. The stoppage means that the vast majority of U.S. film and TV productions will grind to a halt. Tonight, an unprecedented Hollywood shutdown. sag after, which represents 160,000 actors, saying they'll strike at midnight after failing to reach an agreement with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which represents studios including NBC Universal. How they plead poverty that they're losing money left and right when giving hundreds of millions of dollars to their CEOs. It is disgusting. Starting Friday, actors will join writers who have been picketing since May for the first joint strike since 1960. The breakdown in negotiations came down to streaming residuals and AI protections. Disney CEO Bob Iger responding to the actors' demands. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic. That is, quite frankly, very disruptive. Today at the London premiere of Oppenheimer, Matt Damon and Emily Blunt walking out after appearing on the red carpet amid news of the strike. They are fighting not for themselves, but for the rest of the guild, because the most powerful members can pick up the least powerful members. The duet strike is unlike anything we've seen in decades. Films currently in production like Deadpool 3 and Wicked are expected to immediately come to a halt. Movies already set to be released, like Barbie and Meg 2, will still hit theaters, but A-list celebrities won't participate in any promotion, which will impact studio profits. The strike comes as studios scramble to cash in on streaming, while at the box office, Indiana Jones and The Flash have failed to break even. Tonight, questions remain how long it could take to get the show back on the road.
Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Australia has appointed the first female head of its central bank. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said, passing over the current governor to elevate his deputy to the high-profile job amid a public backlash over steepingly rising interest rates. A rocket engine exploded during a test in Japan, the latest in a series of failures that have deflated the country's space ambitions. No injuries were reported, but footage showed flames shooting out the side of the test facility. U.S. President Joe Biden said that the United States was unsure where the ocean was, but quipped that the Wagner mercenary chief would be possible. Biden remarked that during a visit to Finland to welcome it as NATO's latest member. China's state flood control and drought relief headquarters launched an emergency response for flood control for parts of the country's northern and northeastern regions. Flames and thick smoke rose above the scorched houses and burnt cars in Croatia as wildfires broke out. With at least one village burnt and several others threatened as temperatures continued to soar in the country. And that wraps up this week's edition of World News. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight on the mountain slopes in the Swiss village of Villa Alone, where artist Saipe has used chalk and charcoal to paint giant frescoes of children sketching how they see the vast world around them. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a great weekend.